you're a preneur hiring and retaining veterans employer resource group panel this morning we're here to discuss some of the challenges and best practices with recruiting uh, and hiring veterans as well as retaining veterans I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Rosalinda Mori. I'm with the Institute for Veterans and Military Families at Syracuse University. Uh, and I would like to take the time for the panelists to introduce themselves. So, Good morning, everybody. My name is Abe McCann, and I'm with the Arizona Coalition for Military Families. Good morning, everybody. Rick Erickson uh, with Snell & Wilmer Law Firm here based in Phoenix. Um, we have about 12 offices and about 3,000 employees, including the lawyers. I'm also a, a JAG, currently serving in the Marine Corps Reserve, uh, so technically not a veteran yet, but uh, I use that to help in our veteran hiring practices. Morning, my name is Paul Rose. I'm with Arizona Public Service Company, APS. I'm retired uh, Navy Master at Arms Chief, uh, served 20 years and one day in the United States Navy. Uh, APS gave me a opportunity I couldn't refuse and I've been with APS for about 10 years now and I currently work since I was a master at arms working law enforcement in the Navy I naturally converted over to corporate security with APS and I am also the president of our veteran employee engagement group uh, I thoroughly enjoy working with our veterans for retaining training transitioning things like that so I'm excited to be here today and talk with you about our veteran group thank you Good morning, my name is Patrick Fitzhugh uh, with USAA. Uh, we have uh, about 600 veterans at our North Phoenix location and spouses. Uh, I'm prior Air Force from 2003-2007. I was an Air Force SEER specialist, uh, run survival school. Not a lot of that translated into the civilian world, but it's, uh, it's been fun. Uh, I've been at USA for seven years now, and I do lead our on-campus employee resource group for veterans, VetNet. And uh, to all our veterans in active serving out there, thank you guys. Okay, good morning. I am uh, Mike Bianchi. I'm with the Institute for Veteran and Military Families at uh, Syracuse University, and I am here to escape these seven inches of snow that are on my back porch. Um, so uh, I am the Senior Director of Education and Career Training at the Institute. I am a uh, career Army veteran, uh, retired. I joined for, uh, joined for the college fund and stayed for the retirement. So looking forward to the discussion. My name is Lane Shereskin. I'm director of uh, channel operations at Nextiva. We're one of the fastest growing voice over IP companies in the nation, also a software company. Uh, I've been with the company for four years. I'm a veteran myself. I have four, uh, former active duty, a lieutenant colonel in the National Guard currently. Uh, and here just to talk about uh, the potentials Nextiva has for veterans and how we're growing quickly uh, and how they meet the technology and IT mindset very well. My name is Nick Belinsky. Yeah. My name is Nick Belinsky, and I'm with Tech Systems and Aerotech. I'm our uh, direct placement manager for the state, as well as focusing on recruiting vet veteran talent throughout the region. Uh, as far as uh, my veteran background, served four years in the Air Force, uh, all on the state side, and uh, part of the Arizona Corporate Council. I'm glad to be a member and happy to be here today. Thank you. Well, thank you, panelists. Um, so I, I guess I'd like to just begin and really not uh, any question pertaining to one individual, but I, I hope that you just jump in uh, if you'd like to answer the question. So um, I guess I'd like to start with recruiting So and then having an honest and candid conversation about it. Um, what has worked or hasn't worked in, you know, uh, in finding or sourcing military talent? And I leave that open to anybody to start. I guess I'll kick it off. <laughs> Morning, everybody. Um, APS, we're we're very veteran oriented. Oriented. We have the Palo Verde Nuclear Generating Station, and 35% of our workforce out at Palo Verde is actually veterans. And so, when we create our job descriptions and our recruiting uh, posts and everything, it goes out nationwide. And we actually try to word our job descriptions as far as military, um, trying to hit those things that veterans recognize. Uh, a lot of the verbiage in the corporate world is not as specific compared to the military world. So a lot of the military resumes that we see, they come in with acronyms and things like that. We try to work with our veterans to say, you know, the, you gotta work out these acronyms because a lot of civilian employers that may not be veterans themselves, they don't really understand and those resumes don't stand out. So I work with our human resources department and we try to, you know, 
provide some counsel as far as, okay, this is what this veteran is trying to say. Although it looks on the cover that it may not fit the job description, the minimum requirements, it actually does when we explain it to them. And so we try to work with our HR to make sure that all of our veteran resumes that we receive are recognized. And we also work with the veterans externally to help them write their resumes to make sure that they are recognized externally. So that's one thing that APS does as far as our recruiting to make sure that we're hitting the best market and giving the veterans an opportunity to come into the corporate world like myself. So, yeah. and, and on a similar note, uh, almost uh, to counteract, not counteract that, but to protect from that, is also kind of a policy ask a veteran kind of. Hey, uh, we have you know a pretty large recruiting team. Uh, they're bringing candidates in all the time. They get a veteran resume. They don't know exactly what it means because the acronyms, because of the job title that may not connect correctly like you were talking about. So we say, hey, grab one of the directors, one of the senior managers, one of the vice presidents that are a veteran, have them look at the resume, interpret it for you. That way, not only will that recruiter understand it better, but if he's actually passing it to a hiring manager and they don't know, at least he has some cliff notes on it so that everyone across the organization understands it. And you know, there's also a little checking muster there. Hey, has the veteran who reviewed it, is this legit? You know, are they telling the truth? Are these things that are really happening out there? Uh, or it will help them generate questions that will uh, uncover things that if they aren't quite uh, matching up or ask those leading questions that will get them to talk about the things we want them to talk about, about their experiences, about their proven uh, successes in the past. So that's really what's important is making sure that when that resume comes in, not only that it's getting past the first step, but that the conversation is going in the right direction. I think those are actually brilliant um, best practices uh, for employers to do, especially uh, APS, working with the veteran directly in terms of uh, correcting, if you will, or translating that resume. Uh, there's a lot of businesses that will just set that aside. Uh, so working a little bit further upstream with our career skills, uh, excuse me, the SkillBridge program, the DOD SkillBridge program, uh, working with uh, uh, Onward to Opportunity uh, that runs at the 18 different military installations and goes across, uh, we have, we're enrolling 750 participants a month. Uh, across the country, there's over uh, 150 now, I believe, career skills programs, <coughs> excuse me, that are part of the DOD skill bridge. And what that does is that is an effort to train, provide apprenticeships, provide certifications and internships earlier in the pipeline. So APS shouldn't get that resume with the acronyms in it. And it, excuse me, it provides that opportunity for veterans to really start to understand that workplace culture further upstream. But for those that don't enter into a SkillBridge program or may have become veterans prior to the existence of SkillBridge, um, I think that as a best practice, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. And as a, as a law firm, we have a little narrower focus on veteran hiring. We're, we're more limited to looking for lawyers who are coming out of law school. but. It's a great point about being a liaison. As a, as a veteran, someone who, who has military service, we can provide insight as to how a person's military service on their resume translates into becoming a great employee, a great attorney. We have a large amount of support staff who make the attorneys look, look good. Um, and you know they're, they're critical to what we do uh, at our firm. So, it's great to, because we have about 35 veterans among our 12 offices, and we really try to funnel resumes with veterans to those people and make sure they're the ones interviewing and coordinating with the hiring committee so that people can, can understand how they're going to contribute. So for example, a JAG coming out of the military doesn't have a real good sense of civil practice, but in our experience, the, the amount of trial experience that a JAG has in the military translates very well to like products liability where they'll spend a lot of time in the courtroom and their trial experience, veterans have a, have a, they're very good at transitioning their military practice to a private practice. It's not rocket science. It's the same type of rules of evidence, same types of rules of, of procedure. So we find that um, interpreting their experience and, and helping our partners understand how they're going to be able to contribute is really helpful to uh, giving veterans careers and opportunities at our offices. You know, in, in Arizona, through, the, through my organization, the, the Coalition for Military Families, we work with all different sized companies to translate those resumes and to not only translate the skill set to civilian speak, but also to navigate the difference in cultures in the workplace. And the companies that I work with through our Veteran Supportive Employer Program 
the ones that are really successful in recruiting are the ones that have taken the time to realize that they lack that skill. And if they don't have those people that are available in their staff to help with, they attend the free trainings that we have in the state, you know, veteran culture, resource navigators, things like that. Um, we even do a class on how to interview a veteran, which is a really dynamic class because it goes a long way to illustrate the military mindset and behavior pattern in the, in the um, interview process, but also really highlights the civilian, the, the civilian side in the sense that it's a fun way because it is a kind of a funny class. We do a mock promotion board and there's a little bit of yelling and you know some facing movements and then you have that <coughs> stiff vet sitting in front of the HR person trying to answer a question about which one of the three bears would they most likely be in the workplace, you know? So, but it, it really is a fun <coughs> and safe way to kind of expose some of those, those gaps and the companies, like just to reiterate, the companies that I work with that are successful, that's why they're successful because they acknowledge that and then they do something about it. I have to jump aboard with that too because Oftentimes, I spent 10 years with APS, I wondered how in the world did I come from being a Navy active duty veteran to getting a job such as APS? And I've looked back at my interview process when I first got hired, and I know my resume was, it, it was probably acronyms and things like that. And even on my interview panel, I had never experienced a star type of question ever in my life. And I look back, I'm like, how did I get this job, right? <laughs> and when I look back, at, I answer my own question. There was a veteran sitting on the interview panel, a Marine uh, retired veteran, and he sat there. And I know when I walked out the room, they're probably scratching their heads like, what did this guy just say? And that Marine veteran that sat on my interview panel said, this is what he meant by this. This is his chain of command. This is this. Here's what he's saying on his resume. And I know for a fact, that's what allowed me to get my foot in the door with APS and gave me the opportunity I have to be sitting here today. So that's good. Just to add one note to that, it's not working, but one note to that is um, working and applying through HR is great, but it takes a whole company. It takes a culture. The number one way anyone gets a job is a referral base. Mm -hmm. So if you're relying on one department to do that for you, it, it's going to be very difficult. So when you build that culture, and some of the panel members here, their, their companies are great in so many more ways than just veteran hiring. And they built that, and they've educated all their employees of how important it is on bringing that talent to their company and what, how that will impact them moving forward, as the more veterans they may bring on may affect their own career for the better. So referral-based is a huge part, get the whole team involved. So I'll say for uh, USAA, that is big for us, is that referral base. And I think one of the keys that's been successful for us is uh, you want to make sure that they are fully aware of what the culture is before they even start looking into you or before they interview with you and that they can connect with that culture piece. Um, job fit aside, if they can't connect with that culture, we already know the issues with retaining the veterans to begin with. Um, they're going to be a lot less likely to even entertain that. So if you can match the culture and get that referral aligned, uh, you're going to be setting yourself ahead of everybody else right away. So, Rosie, I know you want to get to your next question, but I just think that we, I just really want to quickly mention to the employers in the room, um, I was at a SHRM conference a few weeks ago, um, and they have just written a how-to guide for HR professionals um, for hiring veterans. And not only did they write the HR guide, they've also uh, provided a free certification. So there's a lot of uh, collaborative work that went into that. Uh, I think uh, Comcast uh, helped present that, as well as Psych Armor. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the IVMF and the Student Veteran Organization. And I think it is uh, shermfoundation.org backslash veterans at work. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about the HR cultural competencies or the organizational competencies of understanding the culture, this is an excellent foundation. And I think you mentioned a few resources here in Arizona as well. So just wanted to put that out there for employers as a, yet another resource to understand that dialogue. No, and I think this really leads to the next set of questions because we're really talking about it as building that culture. <coughs> One is understanding the culture to the company, but another is really the culture within the company with your own employees. So how do the company, I mean, how, what has worked or not worked in building your own culture? Um, and then I also want to follow up because everybody <coughs> talks about having a liaison. How do you build that culture with the non-veteran employees? So I'll speak to USA because that is in our DNA and that really is something that uh, is easy for us because that's who our market is. But um, one thing that we've definitely been intentional about is 
bridging that gap between veteran and civilian because so often uh, there feels like there's this divide, right? So with, uh, within our employee resource group, we make sure that we're targeting also our non-veterans, our non-military spouses with events, um, with communications, and that we make sure that they're coming to the table and, and creating that comfortable environment where they can ask those questions. And we also challenge our, our veteran employees because one of the things that most veterans don't like doing uh, is sharing you know, personal feelings and experiences and all those things that you don't get to do while you're in the military, right? Um, opinions. So uh, to get them at the table together and uh, with efforts of putting them on, uh, on track to solve business issues, getting them to collaborate and work together with a focus on our military, I think we found that that's really been able to bridge that divide between them. One thing I want to talk about culture too is almost a challenge. So uh, Nextiva is a tech company, very entrepreneurial, uh, very off on your own, get it done and, and accomplish the mission, which veterans are good at. Uh, but the key thing is sometimes it's very high level guidance and veterans kind of just need a little more. Just, hey, I, this is the end state I want for you. Uh, and here's uh, how I best like it. So I found uh, um, training the leadership to understand, all right, this is a veteran, he's going to do the job and he's gonna do amazing at it. But you have to give him the end state and where you want it to go. Uh, don't leave it completely open because we're, we're used to a lot of guidelines in the military. Uh, we've had a lot, all those things are built into SOPs and everything else, so you don't need them necessarily. But when you get out into a, a more open environment, they're, they're like, all right, what's my left and right limit? And the, given that guidance is so important because you'll get so much more productivity out of them. Uh, they'll be, uh, feel more engaged and they'll feel like they're actually making progress. Because one, one of the biggest things I find with veterans, veterans want the feedback. They want to know that they're successful. They want to know that they're hitting their goals. Uh, and if that's not there, uh, they're going to feel like they are constantly having to catch up. So it's just kind of coaching leadership to provide their veterans with the right goals uh, and guidance so that they're getting the maximum effect out of them. And also that grows the whole culture across the organization. Then they see the successes of the veteran employees and it really makes a difference there. Uh, and then how we engage the rest of the culture uh, with veterans is also we do, you know, things in the community, just like, you know, we all uh, basically do a leadership um, team builder at a, a veterans golf tournament. So we're raising money for the Pang Patriots, the Air National Guard. Uh, we're going there at, as a team, uh, growing our teamwork, and it's kind of a memorable event we've done for four years now. So those kind of things, Pat's Run, we all sponsor, anyone in the company who wants to run Pat's Run, hey, go out and do it, we'll pay for you. So those kind of things are what uh, gets everyone kind of behind the idea there. And we're, we're actually one of the companies that is still formulating uh, an affinity group uh, right now because we're younger and we're growing. Uh, so it's important that we get all these together and, you know, getting the senior executives like the CIO is a big supporter uh, on the veteran initiative. So he's one of the backers that will probably be, you know, the, the uh, executive sponsor for that group when it comes to, to fruition. You know, we live in a, the time we live in now, you always hear the buzzwords, diversity, inclusion. You know, there's all these social movements and you hear words like millennial and there's these like cultural gaps just in society. And I think one thing that gets lost with veterans is that we are extremely diverse. Absolutely. I'm a 42-year-old Army vet, you know, I was in 2006 is when I got out, you know, and now I'm in a situation where the conflicts that I fought in, my son is eligible to fight in now. Kids that I babysat are in that war right now and doing things, and me and my son, could we're complete opposites, you know, as far as our mindsets, our culture goes and everything, and I think one thing that gets lost when trying to connect with veterans is we come across or people have this preconceived notion that we only operate on task condition standards. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. We're very rigid. We don't think outside the box. We're, you know, we're this scary person and don't talk to us. You know, we run around knife handing people. But when that kind of curtain is pulled back and you have these opportunities to tell non veterans that, okay, we're going to interact with veterans, we're going to do events, just that little bit of reminder that, hey, these people are just like you. In fact, they were just like you before they became veterans. And I think. Companies that remember that and kind of focus on that are really successful in building those cultures and bridging gaps. So I, I like what you brought about all the DNI groups. I want to touch base on that because I think in, in Phoenix alone right now we have six different DNI groups, diversity inclusion groups, and uh, what we have uh, made sure we're very intentional with is how do we use those DNI groups to focus on the vil the, the military uh, culture and how diverse we are as veterans as well. So. Uh, just this last week as we got ready for Veterans Day, we had a, uh, with our female 
diversity business group, we had a panel of all female veterans come up from each different branch, different ranks, and share their stories with non-military employees. And they said single-handedly that was one of the best interactions that they've had or events they had rotten, just hearing their, their peer employees talking about why they served, uh, some of their experiences, what they did, the impact and the skills that they're bringing into the workforce, because you're right, uh, to when we do have that divide, the uh, civilian will tend to think that all military are created equal, right? Um, and that's a goal of ours is to make sure we break down that conception. I got, I got to jump on board because I 110% I agree with you. And being in a veteran group and a president of a veteran group at APS, I got to tell you, we're one of the larger groups. But I keep telling everybody we're the most diverse as well. We don't, we're not just veterans. We're, we're women. We're... LGBT, we're Hispanic, we're black, we're all of these things. And where some of the other groups may be struggling mm -hmm. for their memberships and things like that, I offer our assistance to bring in uh, stories about Medal of Honor winners from all different groups from the military. Because we can reach out to all of these different groups. And I also like what you said about bringing in non-veterans. A lot of people say, oh, I'm not a veteran, I can't join. That is absolutely incorrect. Because without our friends, without our families, we wouldn't be here today. That's what kept us as veterans going strong and even moving forward. I may be the president of our veteran group, and I am a veteran, but Jessica Wells, she's sitting down there. She is not a veteran, but mm -hmm. she is my vice chair for the group. And it's all about the, the heart. And I keep telling her, I says, one day you can run this group because you don't have to be a veteran. You just have to believe in veterans and have the heart to go forward and do great things. That's what it's all about, just like you said. So I appreciate what you said. Thank you. I think some of our, um, our HR people have really responded well to um, programs that have been offered by, for example, ESGR, which has a, a day out at Papago for our staff to go out and put a flak and a helmet on and crawl around in the dirt and eat an MRE. And, and they love it. They come back and they're like, that was really fun. But it, it's less fun and more awareness about what someone that is transitioning from a combat outpost sang in Afghanistan to a corporate conference room looking for a job and a way to fit in and decompress from their experience overseas. Um, and it gives them more insight into the loads they carry, the things they deal with, whether hurry up and wait, uh, all of our military culture that we want to, well, something like that we want to leave behind forever. Uh, but you know, it, uh, our company tends to really respond and we ha there are so many opportunities to be involved in programs to get exposed to veterans groups, whether it's homeless veterans, and, and get a sense of what different uh, veterans are experiencing and how to understand uh, what they've been through, where they come from, so that when you're interviewing them, uh, you're a better source uh, to provide them an, an advantage uh, or a fair look at, uh, at hiring. I was gonna add something from my end with the ERG groups, knowing that there's three main pillars with it, marketplace, workforce, workplace. And Damon John said it great yesterday, is educating yourself first, educating your team, and that's focused on the uh, workplace. I don't necessarily mind if you, know, you have zero veterans in your company or you're 20, 30%. It starts with educating your team first and the value and the importance of it. And then from that point forward, you move on to the next pillar and then the next pillar. And then you have this well-oiled machine that's running on all cylinders and you're known and your brand and your culture is just living and breathing it and for all ERG groups. You know, it doesn't have to just be one or the other. It could be all across the board. So I, it, this is uh, actually pretty funny uh, today because the, the conversation that was just had across the six service members was had at, at, at a dinner table last night with, with my colleagues. Um, and every point that, that you guys have mentioned is, is, is fantastic. And, and so as we discuss it, I think we, we, uh, maybe I don't, it was happy hour, so I think we, we got it right down to uh, communication um, was, I think, the, the, what the thrust was. So there's the culture, there's the education, there's the diversity, inclusion, there's all those things that build up to what it is to become successful in the workplace, both as a veteran and a non-veteran who is serving with a veteran. Um, and it boils down, um, in our considered opinion last night, uh, to communication. Being able to dialogue with that person across the way and the, 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 uh, the company allowing that dialogue to occur um, in a non-confrontational way, in a non-attributional way, just so that there, you can break down some of those barriers of misperceptions that are out there because we all know 
um, from having worked in the community that we have to combat those those different um, perceptions every day, whether it's you know 100% of veterans are all uh, PTSD or we don't ha necessarily have the clinic on cam you know on campus. I had to deal with this uh, in one of my my roles in the service. Was well, we can't have veterans here because we don't have the counseling ready for them. Um, and so it's 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 communication, it's dialogue that encompasses all the great ideas that were mentioned on here. Well, I mean, I think culture and, and yeah, really good points raised uh, or put together, but, um, but all of this really does lead to retention. And I think ultimately, I think that's the goal for most companies is, is to make sure that they retain their talent. Uh, so I'd like to talk about sort of maybe some best practices or challenges uh, in making sure that you retain your veteran talent. You know, one common thing that I deal with when I'm working with employers I, is retention. It's always an issue. Why are they leaving? Why, you know, how do we? And the biggest thing that I seem to, to see driving this issue is sense of purpose. So the military is really great about making every person, every individual task is important. You know, we've all heard the old saying, bullets don't fly without supply. So if the supply sergeant's not doing his job, then the forward operator can't do their job. And if HR in the military is not doing their job, then commander doesn't know, you know a, a full battle spectrum. Where are all my troops, et cetera, et cetera, right? And one thing that you wake up every day in the military, whether you're in garrison or you're in Afghanistan or Iraq, you have a purpose that day. There's always a mission. There's always another something. And sometimes when we join the civilian workplace, I can tell you I struggled with this. You know, When I was first couple years out of the Army, I probably had like 10 jobs just couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. And it wasn't until I found a job in EMS where I refound, reconnected to that. I have a mission today. I have something that, you know, I'm serving a greater good. And the veterans that are successful in finding that are usually successful in business. And it's hard sometimes to convince a, a war fighter to get excited about a sales goal. But when we do all these things like these gentlemen have been talking about, connect to that culture and kind of illustrate how they're part of something bigger and that they do have an important role, that's how you retain those employees. So uh, I want to talk about the leadership interaction too, um, because you know you think at you know my organization at USAA, amazing culture, talk about a mission, serving our, our service members. Um, I, I came in front line, answering the phone, you know, getting yelled at about insurance, and on the you know previously I was used to doing the yelling, right? Um, so. While I agree with the purpose and the mission, um, I think if you don't have a leader who can connect that on a daily basis, uh, that's where y you'll lose out. Because you can have that, that amazing purpose as an organization or in that role, uh, but if you don't have a leader who can inspire and engage and make them see that and feel that on a daily basis, uh, the grind is what eventually gets to those veterans because they do want that sense of, I have a, a greater purpose than you know, myself. So I'd say you have to make sure your leaders are having that conversation. And if they don't, uh, to what you're talking about, giving them the tools, they need to know where to go. You know, So I've had other uh, managers reach out to me and my group when they have a veteran who they're worried about being at risk for leaving the company. And, you know, and the next thing we do is we set up a one-on-one -on -one with that employee or a two-on-one -on with that manager and we go talk about uh, what are those barriers? Where are they having difficulties? And sometimes that follow-up is me with that manager giving them you know, some tips and tricks on how do you make this veteran feel like they have that bigger impact and that purpose. So I, I think just to move a little further upstream um, to the, let's call it fit. Yeah. So if you're, gonna, if you're gonna wanna retain, you wanna get the right fit to begin with. Um, and that's where the SkillBridge program really comes into play, where it allows service members to transition, or e the veterans, for example, like Onward to Opportunity and other SkillBridge programs are available to veterans and their spouses and National Guard and Reserve as well. So it's a very inclusive opportunity to get that training and certification prior to, and the cultural acclimation that goes along with it prior to entering into that job. So the key to, I think, the flux is working further upstream as employers, understanding during the interview process that they're, they're look, you have to set a clear um, guidelines for what the job will entail. So for example, if I was interviewing some folks and I was told, wow, you interview very differently than I've, I've ever had an interview before because holy cow, you were honest. 
right? <laughs> like, and so when I tell folks, you know, this is the job, this is how long it may exist, it may not exist, here's the parameters, here's the promotion potential, you put all that out there out front, and, and that's gonna be extremely appreciated, I would think, mm -hmm. by the population on this panel and those in the audience. And so that, I think, further upstream, will, you know, there's all the, all the TT, all the, sorry, uh, <laughs> all the best practices um, towards the end. See, three years later, and I'm still using some acronyms. Um, all the best practices once that employee is in the, the uh, organization, but what goes on further upstream should be considered as well. And I think it boils around fit and honest dialogue with the candidate. Yeah, and you, you kind of just took the words out of my mouth. It's just, we're so used to in the military having that structure of, hey, this is the next step for you. This is the next rank for you. This is the next uh, duty position. Uh, uh, you've been a company commander, you're gonna be an S3. All those kind of things that uh, are kind of built into your mind that you're always looking for in your civilian career. You're like, all right, so I'm here right now. What is that next step? Not, you know, even us, you know, in a, lot, a lot of companies don't have that perfectly filtered out. Like the military's got it down to a science. Like these are the jobs you need to progress your career. In the civilian sector, it's not gonna always be there. So trying to provide that guidance to that veteran and, and say, hey, here is your tour of duty here, uh, what you're gonna be doing, and then this is what the next step is after you're successful in this. Uh, and what we've also done at, at Next Eva, and we, this is not just with veterans, this is across the board, is we, we try to find the right job for the individual. So if they're working in our support department and they, they're, they're putting effort in and they're doing a good job at what they can do, but they're not excelling, like, well, do you want to work with our onboarding team, account management team? Where do you think you'd be best utilized? And we've moved a lot of people around, uh, even from support to marketing, you know, different places, because it was a passion they had, and we found if we nurtured that and gave them the, the resources to do it, that's how you get them to get the maximum potential out of them and let them shine. And they're ha engaged, happy doing what they're doing, uh, and are becoming subject matter expertise because they're passionate. That, that's really what's Im important there. Uh, and, and just like you said also, if we have a veteran who's having challenges, let's engage him. Let's have someone else who's been in their shoes have that discussion with them to make sure that, hey, this is where it's going. What, what parts are we missing on for you? So we can fill that gap. It, it, it's about, communica again, communication all the way. Yeah, we've been excited to, to be a part of the Corporate Council for Veteran Careers because it was, it was a unique, rather than just focusing on jobs, we're focusing on setting up the veteran for success so that retention um, is achieved and they have long-term employment and really an opportunity to be with a company and earn that, that promotion and, and advancement that they're used to and we're setting them up for, uh, for much more success and, 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 and the retention part I think is met by that. It's a great example of something where um, all, all of these companies involved uh, provide very genuine approaches to the veterans who, you know, come come with a lot of fear and expecting uh, not a lot of continuity, l like you described. They they figure they may not find the right fit, or but when we have them introduced to a company from the onset, uh, who is devoted to their uh, their long-term employment, I think I think you you bring them success and more retention as a result. I'm just gonna throw it out there: you guys don't play fair at all. <laughs> because everything that each and every one of you said is what I want to say, Darren. <laughs> so uh, veteran, it's another acronym. And veterans, we love our acronyms. I work for APS, duh. Um, so veteran, veteran, engagement, transition, retention, network. That's what our acronym stands for, retention. It's a big one. And just because I think we all do a great job on bringing in veterans, hiring veterans, and making sure we get them the jobs that they need. Yeah but it's a matter of keeping the veterans. And one thing I noticed, I may be 10 years with APS, I'm a veteran, and Hal, he's my advisor to the group. And I'll meet up with Hal and he'll say, how you doing, Paul? Well, you know, I got this and this and this and this, and he'll give me that wave off like Hal does. I, I, how are you doing? What? How are you doing? You, your wife, your son. And it's like, oh, that's what he meant. He wants me to take a second to recognize I'm a person. Are you happy in your job? Are you happy doing the things that you're doing? I know you're busy, but how are you doing? And it's good because it brings me back into reality that, thanks, somebody's actually looking out for my well-being. Somebody's interested in how's your career doing? How's your job doing? How can I help to, if you want something different, how can we move you around? 
And I think that's really big with all of our veterans because a lot of them get into the job and they're like, I didn't sign up for this. And in the military, you cut orders. You do those orders for three, four, five years. You don't like it, tough. You're doing it anyway until you're up for the next set of orders. But in the corporate world, it's not that way. You can always go on to different job sites and, hey, USA is hiring you. Like, hey, you got corporate security over there, buddy? You know, we can shop around. And that's, it's good for the veterans if that's what they want to do. But I think if we focus on maintaining and retaining our veterans, hey, you're working in supply chain right now, but you're interested in corporate security, how can we mentor you and get you to that level that you want to be so you are happy staying with the company? Because once you're with the company, as we all know, you get invested. You start earning more PTO, you start earning your tenure, and you don't want to lose that. I, I don't think veterans quite understand that tenure is very important. I love that you're highlighting that the coalition piece because if you're an employer and you're focused on this, the one thing I would tell you is you can't do it alone. Um, you're going to need to surround yourself with other uh, military-focused organizations uh, and groups and networks to make sure that you're learning those best practices. Um, two things that we've done recently, and one, one thing I think we're all kind of alluding to here is really that brotherhood. Whether you're you're you know male or female in the military, you have a sense of trust that. Uh, with those you're serving with, which is really hard to come by uh, outside of the military, right? So how do you create that sense of trust and those relationships? Because I can plug um, most veterans in a cubicle, tell them to work, and they're gonna work eight, 10 hours a day and go home. And they'll come back and do the same thing if I tell them to do that again, right? So uh, we have a program called Veteran Sponsorship Program, just like if you're PCSing to a new duty station, our new employees who have gotten out of the military within a certain period of time, they're actually partnered up with someone of the same rank and uh, the same service, if possible. And they have a two-year relationship, which is really up to them. We give them some basic guidelines, but it's up to them to facilitate. And it's been um, so successful that I've even had some uh, newer employees say, hey, my sponsor hasn't really been you know, reaching out to me. Here's what I'm looking for. And I'm able to plug them in with somebody else. Uh, one of the things I really liked about uh, last year is we piloted a program, which I, I hope to bring back, but our, our brand new hires who are participating in this veteran sponsorship program, before they actually started day one, we're bringing them on campus. Uh, showing them the the office, showing them uh, what a day in the life looks like. Okay, here's you're gonna be on the phone. This is you. You know you can move about eight feet away from it. Uh, you, you're told when your lunch and your break is. Then we would actually go and have a very candid conversation in a conference room of these are where most of our veterans, when they do leave and decide to go, these are the things that they've struggled with. You know, what questions do you have? And I think that's where it goes back to that clear communication, which in the end builds trust, right? And that's what that's doing. Um, and when it comes to career progression, we do have a VETS lead program where we're working with active military as they're getting out of the military or recently separated, and we are uh, putting them in our own development program where ultimately they're gonna have a job uh, of like kind or level of responsibility instead of having to work their way up through the ranks and echelon and we're at rotating them around so they get to see all the business pieces. Uh, and for those who can't get into that, we've actually created our own career map specifically for veterans. So, okay, you're now in the company, you don't have that checklist of do this, do this, do this, do this, you're promoted, but we've given them a specific set of tools and uh, we have introduced it to the entire company, you know, because anyone can use it, but it's really the structure piece that our veterans like to see of where do I go to build these skills, what are my resources, what's my timeline, and now they've got a target and they get to set foot and go forward. And, and so just, to, and I don't know where you are on your question, so I'll just, I'll talk about the, the Pathfinder playbook. So you can see um, that we're, our co-founder, our founding partner is J.P. Morgan Chase. And very similar to what USAA has done, uh, we have just reviewed for them a Pathfinder playbook, which what that is, is that is that onboarding, that in-processing, that cultural acclimation for, and I don't want to use the word acclimation, uh, cultural awareness um, for that person, that veteran that is now entering into J.P. Morgan Chase. It's a very thorough, much well thought out. So, as Patrick was saying, if you're if you're an employer, there are tools out there, and I would venture a guess that there are organizations that will will share. You know, we're a big fan in the service, as we all know in this room, of somebody else's work was pretty good. So let's put it up on this slide, right? So I, I'm I'm telling you that there are there are tools and resources out there for employers and for veterans. So if you're a veteran in the room, uh, or if you're uh, transitioning out of the service, you know you have that responsibility to also understand 
um, the cultural the culture that you're moving into. You go through you sit through hours of cultural training before you deploy somewhere. You know, think about moving into into USAA or JP Morgan Chase or APS as your next deployment. Uh, you're you're going to learn how to say stop. You know, you're going to learn how to do all those things that you need to do. So there are resources out there. It's great to see that USA has it. I know that JP Morgan Chase has it, and and it leads to the question that Rosie started with, retention. Definitely. Um, so actually, we only have a few minutes left, and I do want each of the panelists to maybe give some final thoughts or, or observations, anything you'd like to talk about. So I'd like to start with you. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here today. And to piggyback off of what you were saying, sir, in Arizona, there are a lot of those organizations that provide those tools for employers. My organization, the Arizona Coalition for Military Families, covers every topic we've discussed today, and we do so at no cost to employers. So if anybody would like more information, please contact me. And my last little bit would be just, don't be afraid of your veterans. We're not that bad, I swear. <laughs> yeah, I would just say, let, let's keep doing this. Um, getting together in these groups, supporting one another, uh, it's, it's the key because the, to, as a veteran, I, I think they see these things happening, they come to these events and they feel like they, they have um, not an advantage, but uh, a, an open door to so many different large employers, uh, to so many opportunities, and they see that we're all talking about it, and we're coming together and having breakfast, and we're and we understand that uh, that the support is there. So um, I, that that's all I would say is let's keep doing this. Uh, for the veterans out there, uh, whether you're active, reserve, or you've been out for quite a while, uh, best thing I could recommend is network. Talk with uh, other veterans, talk with everybody else. And once we hire veterans, a lot of veterans are like, I, I, I didn't do anything or you know, I don't need to go to this game or get involved. But it's, it's not only for you. Think of it as your peers. The other veterans want to hear from you. They want to relate to you. So remember that uh, even though you don't, because most veterans, we don't go around, you know, I mean, once you get us going and have a few drinks at happy hour, yeah, we can get the sea stories going. <laughs> But on the up and up in the normal day-to-day -day basis, we don't talk about ourselves. We don't talk about our stories unless you get us going. And I think it's important to share our stories, share the things that we have to offer, whether you think it's important or not. It's just a matter of talking. And that's therapeutic, not only for everybody else, but for all of us as well. Because we have all have our ups and downs, and I think being a part of something bigger than we are is a major thing of being a veteran and sharing those adventures and things like that. So with that, so go forward and do great things. So you beat me to it this time. So, and, and one of the challenges I always talk to uh, my veteran employees is it's, it's our responsibility as veterans to uh, carry on that legacy, to share those stories about you know, our brothers and sisters who, who aren't here with us today, right? And uh, to, to pay honor to them in doing that. Uh, the one tip I definitely would give our veterans out there is education continue to develop those skills, even if it's not going to be a degree. You've got some amazing resources, not just the GI Bill, but other programs that are available out there to further your education and develop new skills. Um, if you hold still on this, the rest of the world will continue to move past you. And I think one of the difficulties I've, when I talk to veterans in the workplace, it's, well, don't they know what I did? Don't they know what I'm capable of? Right, and t the difficult conversation I have to have is, well, what are you doing today? Right, what's your what's your proposition, your value statement today? So continue to develop those skills and uh, and use that education. And for the employers out there, I'd say when you bring these veteran events to the workplace, um, that relationship is really two way. So we just did uh, at the end of October, we had kind of our version of what you guys did. We had uh, 30 active drill instructors come out and about 120 employees volunteered. Some of them have done it multiple times uh, to go through a simulated zero day. Day one of getting off the, the bus, getting processed and all that fun stuff, it goes on for about three to four hours. The impact on the employees is really fantastic when it ties them to the mission, but here's the other piece. For me as a veteran uh, employee and for the other veteran employees, to see the non-veterans, to see the civilians come out and sacrifice their time and to do that, that shows to me that they care about the military, that shows that they care about me, right? So it's a two-way piece. We, we wanna make sure that we tie that back to the veteran that the other side of the aisle cares about them as well. Okay, 
It's almost as if we rehearsed it. So uh, I'm going to talk about training and education. Uh, so for, for veterans um, and transitioning service members, uh, I'm not sure if that's a, a USREC guy down there. Are you, are you a recruiting command guy? All right, so you're going to make sure you tell all the recruits this stuff too, right? All your depths. So um, it's, it's training, certification, and education that lead to meaningful employment. And there are opportunities out there. I challenge you to Google free veteran certificates and try to go through the first 10 pages. Salesforce has a free certification. The, you know, I just left North Carolina where Cisco, uh, we're their service provider, I'm to opportunity, it's gonna be the service provider for Cisco, uh, I, ISC Squared, um, AWS, Amazon Web Services, NetApp, NDG, uh, Palo Alto Networks, and I don't wanna forget 140 Net. Um, where they're going to offer free cyber certifications uh, to veterans as a consortium. So um, the training and the certifications to what Patrick was talking to the veterans about is what are you, what are you relevant at, right? And I'm telling you, cool is not going to do it for you, if the credentialing online. So you have to have a no kidding industry credential. And for veterans, there are a lot, not only of the free certifications, but you've got some GI Bill as well. Mm -hmm. So don't... One of the things that used to drive me crazy as a leader is say, hey, why aren't you using your job, Bill? And I say, well, that's for my kids. Well, sure, that's great that it's for your kids, but it's also for you, right? Because you need to be employed. So um, get those certifications. Look for those uh, educations. Look for what's good for you as a veteran that's going to make you pertinent and make you relevant today, as Patrick was talking about. And they're out there. And Onward to Opportunity is one of those programs that is available to all um, members of the tr of the military community to include spouses, um, but there are others like that out there. Uh, Microsoft Service Academy, you know, just to name a few that we've talked about. So uh, to employers, um, those the consortium uh, that I just mentioned, uh, that is something that it, you know we talked about. It's not something you want to do alone. There are there are a team of of organizations out there that want to do so. If you want access to veterans further upstream in the pipeline. What are you bringing to the table? Because you have to invest. What are the certifications that you're looking for? Are there nonprofit organizations like Onward to Opportunity who you could umbrella underneath to offer certifications to the 12,000 people that we're going to enroll? Are there other organizations outside of Onward to Opportunity that you can partner with? Are there, and, it, and there is. I mean, just listening to the resources that are available here on this panel. So that, that's, uh, that's my final word. So thank you. Yeah, and resources, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, for veterans, um, you're talking about the different things to take classes in, but if you need help, there are so many organizations who are funded by the government, funded by private companies to help you. Google that next. After you Google his page, Google, hey, I need help finding a job as a veteran. There are companies that will, no charge to you, and are getting paid to do this, will help you find a job, will help you uh, match correctly, help you write your resume, uh, can help you build your network, and uh, that's just a huge part of it. Uh, you know, everyone says, you know, applying, applying, applying is great, but if you know someone, it's gonna help you get in the door and help you meet the people you need to, to be uh, identified as the right person. On the other side, for the employers, uh, same thing, there's so many resources out there. You know, I'll make that, that pitch again, the Arizona Corporate Council uh, for Veteran Careers, uh, most of us are on it in this, on this panel here, I think, of all of us. Um, it's, it's just a great network to learn more. There's so much out there. And that's what I'm gonna recommend. You know, we got USREC right there, so we got the PAYS program, uh, Partnership for Youth Success, where you guarantee someone a interview when they get off active duty or when they come back from basic training for the reserves. Uh, you, you, you have so many different things you use. You SkillBridge, my brother used it, found a great job in San Francisco, a great success story. There's a company that focuses only on SkillBridge and placing people in SkillBridge called Shift. Uh, so there's a lot, so many resources out there. So what I recommend is, you know, go through that brainstorming session look at all the resources, then pick two or three, and learn those very well and get the most out of them. You could add more later, but learn two or three of them, utilize them fully, and then start growing what you're using as a base. Because again, it can get completely overwhelming on both sides with the amount of resources there are, so make sure you're doing the focus. And then if you know someone, both on the employer and employee side, that have gone through the process, grab a buddy and bring them with you. And, hey, help me, I need help. Because it, it, don't, be, don't be tough, you know, we're, we're military, we like being tough, we like being independent, but grab your buddy and have your ranger buddy help you through it and get through it. It's just so important. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much the, the key point. Flock. To end it, I'll simply just say be vulnerable. And we're trained to be very strong, be prepared, 
Um, but at the same time, it is okay to ask for help. I don't care if you're looking for a job or if you're a company trying to build culture, asking for help doesn't make you weak. It only makes you stronger. I'll leave on that. Good. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, and I think that concludes our panel. So. Thank you. Thanks, sir.